In the annals of aeronautic history, the plane that takes the place between Republic's classic air fighters, the P-47 Thunderbolt of the Second World War, and their outstanding F-105 Thunder Chief in the skies of Vietnam is often skipped over. This period of expansion marked the first ventures into jet aircraft, and many of the lessons learnt during the development of this series of planes have sired today's generations of fighter aircraft. Successor to the P-47 Thunderbolt of World War II fame, the Republic F-84 Thunderjet was designed in 1944 as a mid-wing day fighter with a top speed of 600 miles per hour. The Thunderjet and its many variants were to make their mark during this era, as had their propeller-driven forebears, the Jugs, for their toughness and their sheer workhorse capabilities. In early 1945, the U.S. Army ordered 100 models of the P-84, and the aircraft had its first flight the following year. The F-84D and the F-84E both entered operational service in 1949 and were the first models of the Thunderjet to participate in the Korean conflict. During the Korean War, many first-time accomplishments were set. It was the first conflict in which jet aircraft were used extensively in aerial combat, and it included the first jet-to-jet -jet aerial fighting. On the 27th of June, 1950, two days after North Korea invaded South Korea, President Truman ordered American Air Forces into action in Korea. However, because of rigorous post-World War II budget cuts, the majority of aircraft able to be deployed had been developed in the early 1940s, and the might of American air power was only a shadow of the war years. The jet aircraft then in development were severely limited by their range and takeoff and landing requirements, and as such the initial battles were fought using the propeller-driven F-51s, F-4Us, A-1s, B-26s and B-29, all of which had served admirably in the last World War, but were definitely outdated with the dawning jet age. The first air missions were flown from irregular matted strips by the Air Force from rough bases in Korea, jets from Japan and by the Marines from US Navy carriers. These missions succeeded in slowing and then eventually stopping the advance of the communist troops and allowing the retreat and evacuation of UN forces back to Busan. B-29 heavy bombers were used in the role of interdiction and strategic missions, which disrupted the North Korean supply, advance and staging attempts. The F-84s were originally destined to be flown as bomber escorts. This role became more demanding in the end of 1950 and was actually filled by the new North American F-86 Sabres. The production of other F-84 and F-86 aircraft had been in accelerated development for use in Korea in the event that the conflict continued. The aircraft were readied for delivery in mid-October, but were delayed because the conflict appeared to be drawing to a close after the North Korean army was repelled from South Korea. However, on the 9th of November 1950, there was a major development in the conflict the North Korean forces began deploying MiG-15 jets. The US forces were then forced to deploy their more modern aircraft. The F-84 would see combat in Korea in December of 1950. Like the older Lockheed F-80, the F-84 had been designed and intended as a day interceptor. However, both proved inadequate to perform day fighter missions in Korean operations. The MiG-15 was 40 to 80 knots faster than the F-84 and 60 to 100 knots faster than the F-80. 
The Thunder jets were, however, barely maneuverable enough to keep out of the way of the MiGs as soon as the Russian planes appeared. It wasn't until the deployment of North American F-86 Sabres that the fight was able to be taken to the MiGs. With the appearance of the jet-powered MiG-15 flown by Chinese pilots, achieving and maintaining air superiority became more challenging for the United Nations. These Soviet-built swept-wing aircraft could outclimb the jet-powered American F-86A and had a 10,000-foot higher service ceiling than the Sabres. The MiG's performance advantage was especially notable at these higher altitudes, but the North American F-86 had better flying qualities and was a more stable gun platform. Additionally, American pilots proved to be more capable than their communist counterparts, which helped to even the odds. Today, debates still rage about the attributes and vices of both planes. As a consequence, the primary mission of F-84s in the conflict became their secondary design role, and in the close air support of ground forces, the heavy bomb load of the F-84 made it particularly effective. Throughout the war, engineers at Republic continued development on the basic F-84, and several improved variants, including the F-84E, 84F and 84G, which became the most numerous, were conceived. The hastily constructed and overused runways in the Far East, particularly those inside Korea, were accessible to the F-84s, though the jet's requirements of longer runways proved to be a large area of concern. The problem was overcome with the fitting of jet-assisted takeoff equipment, particularly when fully loaded for the ground attack missions. The rocket packs were jettisoned after takeoff and retrieved for reuse on the next mission. This proved to be less than ideal. In group formations, the smoke caused by the solid rocket boosters obscured the vision of all but the lead aircraft, forcing ensuing pilots to take off using instruments only. All of the initial jets in this era, however, suffered from underpowered engines. Even in the later swept-wing models, this rocket assistance was still required. With the upgrades in power and performance, the ability to carry more load soon overtook the advances and the rockets were again to become a common sight on military bases. In a fully laden aircraft, it was considered much safer to use the rocket packs as takeoff than to run the risk of not being airborne when you got to the end of the airstrip. Many Thunder jets were however lost on takeoff when this narrow margin of safety was overextended. The Thunder Jet series had its origin in 1944 as a jet-powered replacement for the famed P-47 Thunderbolt. The initial design concepts were for a straightforward jet adaption of the P-47 airframe, but it was soon proved that such a design was impractical and concepts were started again from scratch. The initial A-model design was a low-wing monoplane with straight laminar flow wings and horizontal tailplanes mounted halfway up the vertical tail. This was fairly general for the time, however the GE J35 turbojet which was chosen was a new axial flow engine, having much lower fuel consumption than that of the older centrifugal flow engines. The smaller diameter of the axial flow engine had the additional advantage in that it allowed the use of a more streamlined, low-drag fuselage. These allowances offered significant advances over the older existing Bell Concepts and Lockheed F-80 Shooting Star. The initial design was to prove extremely adaptable into many subsequent models, and derivatives were developed. In 1946, the most outstanding and high-performance version of the series was contracted into testing and remains an icon of the vision of designers during the era.
The Thunder Scepter's propulsion was provided from a jet engine for most flight and a cluster of four small rocket engines for added thrust during climb and interception. This allowed, even by today's standards, for some very distinctive in-flight maneuvers. One of the two prototypes was the first US fighter to exceed Mach 1 in level flight. The Thunder Scepter design was one of two swept wing modifications based on the original F-84 Thunderjet, the other being the F-84F Thunderstreak. One problem with the Thunderstreak and with most swept wing designs of the era was dangerous performance of low speeds. At low speeds, airflow over the wing tended to pitch the nose up. A rash of such accidents on the F-86 Sabre led to the term Sabre Dance. This problem dogged the series even into the century fighters of later years. The Thunder Scepter's most remarkable design feature was intended to address this problem. The wings were built to be wider at the tip than root, allowing them to generate more lift. This nearly addressed the problems with Sabre Dance by delaying the point of stall on the tip in comparison to that of the rest of the wing. The first prototype made its initial flight on May the 9th, 1949, breaking the speed of sound in December 1951. It was later modified with a small radome for gunnery ranging. The second prototype used a V-tail, but was otherwise similar. By 1954, new designs outperformed the F-91 in speed, range and loiter time. The era of the dedicated day fighter type interceptor was over. Another defining design concept was the ability to vary the angle of incidence of the wing as a whole. Tilting it up for low speed operations during takeoff and landing and then decreasing for high speed flight and cruise. This concept was used to great advantage in later years with bombers and attack planes aboard aircraft carriers. The F-84G, which entered service in 1951, was the first single-seat fighter bomber with atomic capability. As compared to the E-model, it had a better engine, automatic pilot and in-flight refueling devices. The F-84G deployed to the Korean conflict in the summer of 1952. The F-84D and E series were phased out beginning in mid-1952. The F-84G began its phase out in 1955 after a brief stint with the newly formed Air Force Air Demonstration Squadron, known as the Thunderbirds. At the time, the sight of close formation aerobatic jet aircraft must have cemented the public concept of American air superiority at air shows the world over. Even with the benefit of hindsight, flying these early model jets at distances of sometimes less than five feet apart is still an inspiring, if not heroic, sight. With the rapid development of the new science of jet air warfare, concepts allowing jet-powered aircraft onto carriers soon appeared. Two RF-84F airframes were modified to accept Allison turboprop engines. These aircraft, originally the F-106, then redesignated XF-84H, had special propellers designed to rotate at supersonic speeds. The horizontal stabilizer was moved to the top of the vertical stabilizer in a T-tail arrangement to avoid the turbulent propeller wash. The aircraft's first flight was on the 22nd of July 1955, but after ensuing development it was deemed unusable for Navy purposes. It became the fastest propeller-driven aircraft. However, the noise and physiological effect of the blade tips breaking the sound barrier, even during taxiing, became a major area of concern. The din of over 900 sonic booms a second caused nausea and general malaise in the immediate area, even to those wearing ear protection. The effect on a confined carrier deck would have been less than satisfactory. Perhaps luckily, the birth of the steam catapult, refinement of jet design and angle flight decks cancelled the program. 
Many other experimental concepts were based around the soundness of the Thunder Jet's basic design. The XF-103, a delta-wing ramjet-driven interceptor, was a concept on the cutting edge at the time, as ramjets were seen to be the next generation of jet aircraft. The F-84s were used to test the periscope concept of providing vision to pilots for the 103, as the plane would have no cockpit extrusion in an attempt to achieve the higher speeds provided by the ramjet's thrust. The ramjets themselves were tested on F-84s also, though very carefully. Had these engines been run up to full thrust, they would have torn the wings off this F-80 as if they were made of tissue paper. The ramjet engines have gone on into the space program and are today used in missile and drone technologies. The theories proven through the original F-84 and X-17 series have become the basics of high mark physics in aeronautics today. With the worries of nuclear war growing throughout the world, European powers feared the immediate destruction of their airfields with the onset of war. This led to the testing of zero-length launch concepts using F-84Gs. The assumption was that planes could be armed and then shipped on the backs of trucks or moved to individual bunkers to disperse the targets and allow for retaliatory strikes with the onset of conflict. The plane was mounted with a disposable solid rocket booster which would accelerate the vehicle to flight speed, allowing the jet engine to take over. Then the rocket would fall away, returning the plane to aerodynamics efficiency. The concepts were tested extensively using Thunder jets and later with F-100s with the hopes of fitting them to newer interceptor aircraft such as the F-104 Starfighter. The most numerous of the F-84 series was the RF-84F Thunderflash. This was the photographic reconnaissance version of the Thunderstreak. It had many components in common with the F-84F, but differed in having the jet engine fed by a pair of wing root air intakes, the nose being taken up by a bank of cameras. The camera bay and the nose could accommodate up to six cameras in forward-facing individual oblique and vertical installations. The vertical camera bay had hydraulically operated doors. The camera's viewfinder was connected to the cockpit via an intricate periscope. For nighttime photographic reconnaissance missions, photoflash ejectors could be carried in underwing tanks. The last of 715 RF-84Fs rolled off the production lines at Farmingdale in January of 1958 and most were replaced by McDonnell RF-101 Voodoo aircraft in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Another groundbreaking test area of the F-84 was the FICON concepts during the early 1950s. The Air Force decided to conduct experiments on the feasibility of Special Air Command's B-36 heavy bombers carrying fighter aircraft suspended under their bellies. This would not only provide the bomber with its own fighter protection, but would make it possible for the bomber to carry the fighter long distances to a combat zone. Upon reaching the edge of the enemy's territory, the mothership would lower its trapeze and release the fighter, which would dash into enemy territory on a high-speed reconnaissance or nuclear bomb mission. The fighter would then return to the B-36D for hookup and return to home base. The Thunderjet in this FICON configuration made its first flight on March the 30th, 1953. Other specialized aircraft were also developed to these ends. One of the most notable was the rocket-powered McDonnell Goblin. 
The XF-85 Goblin became the smallest jet-propelled fighter ever built and was a parasite fighter designed to be dropped from a bomber, perform its mission and return to the mothership. However, the dangers associated with this parasitism and the subsequent development of mid-air refueling for range extension of fighter aircraft proved so successful that experiments with parasite fighters were discontinued and the FICON operation was phased out in 1956. The closing record of the F-84 series only ends in 1982 in Turkey, when they were finally released from active duty after many years of outstanding service. We'll leave this episode with the last view of this outstanding aircraft in their prime as the chosen instrument of the Thunderbirds in the mid-1950s. This has been another adventure in flying through time. Join us next time when we cast our eyes over the ever-broadening realm of flight. <laughs>